Mayor Pro Tem Selby, we have you on the line, correct? Yes. Uh, mayor Pro Tem, the, the mayor is, um, is, is going to be dialing in in just a couple of minutes here, but in the interest of time, uh, would you be uh, okay with uh, calling the meeting to order as the presiding officer? Yes, sir. Um, I call the January 20th workshop meeting to order. Okay, you can take over now. Thank you, Thank you Mayor Pro Tem Selby. And for our listening audience, we're gonna go ahead and take a roll call to establish the, the members present, uh, as well as establishing the forum. Um, right now, we understand that, uh, that Mayor Owens is not present, but he'll announce himself when he arrives. Um, and we'll go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem Selby has um, been, uh, present. Present. Okay. Commissioner Collins. Yeah. Commissioner Walker. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mann. Here. Commissioner Gordon. Here. And Commissioner Burke. Present. All right. All right, Mayor Pro Tem Selby, uh, you do have a quorum. Okay. We have a quorum. If you would just take over, James, that would be great for me. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Selby. On our agenda, item number two on the agenda, this is presentations and reports. Um, this, is, uh, this is a section that does not require action by the board, but it's intended to provide information both to the board, members of the community, and those who may be present in the audience, either virtually or in person. Item number 2A on the agenda. This is a presentation on quasi-judicial procedures. In this case, the town anticipates having quasi-judicial procedures in upcoming matters, things like conditional use permits and the like. We are, we are absolutely thrilled today to have with us David Owens. David has been the Gladys Coates Distinguished Professor of Public Law and Government at the School of Government at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, he's, been, he's been with the School of Government since 1989. Prior to that, he was an attorney and senior planner for the Wisconsin State Planning Office and spent 10 years with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management. Um, he's also written on a variety of land use topics and he received a graduate planning degree and a law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I can say this, I can say this with the book in my hand. Uh, Mr. Owens has literally written the book on this topic and we are welcoming uh, David Owens to the lectern here at Town Hall. Thank, Thank you, James, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm delighted to help you with uh, working on quasi-judicial procedures. Uh, when I first started in this business, 40 years ago, one of the first uh, comments we had from folks I worked with was that uh, town council should not be allowed to do conditional use permits. It should be illegal for town council to ever do a conditional use permit was a suggestion to the legislature 40 years ago. The legislature has not accepted that recommendation. Town councils can and frequently do do conditional use permits, but it is a challenging task because the legal requirements are demanding and it is a different role than most elected officials are used to following. So uh, I thought it'd be good to spend a few minutes going over what the rules are, why they are there, if you've got any questions about it before you uh, deal with these uh, projects that are coming up. What I would do is first start with sort of explaining a little bit about what a quasi-judicial decision is and how it is different from a legislative decision that you usually make, then talk briefly about things you can do before your hearing, during your hearing, and after your hearing. If you've got questions, comments, observations at any point, please raise them, uh, but I'll also pause at the end of each little segment and see if there are any thoughts or questions you have about that. First thing is distinguishing quasi-judicial from legislative. When you make a legislative decision, the choice to amend the text of the zoning ordinance, the choice to rezone a property, you're making a policy choice where you have very broad discretion and the elected officials decide what is in the best interest of the town of Manio. So, the statute imposes an obligation to get broad public comment on that, to send it to the planning board for review and comment, but you're essentially asking folks, is this a good idea or not? 
what should the setbacks be? What should the height limits be? Is this an appropriate use of this property? Is it better zoned commercial or residential? You're making a policy choice and you solicit public comment as to the wisdom and desirability of that project. However, when you shift over to a quasi-judicial decision, you are not making policy. The question is not, is this a good idea? Is this something that would be appropriate for the town? Rather, the question before you is, does this project meet the standards that are in our ordinance for this type of permit. The only reason you do a hearing is to gather evidence to help you find out whether the project meets the standards or not. A room full of citizens telling you this is a terrible project and would be awful for the town of Manio is largely irrelevant. Just as a large group of folks saying this would be the best thing ever for Manio is largely irrelevant because it's not a legislative decision. The question is, does this project as it is designed meet the standards for a conditional use permit or not? And have you got high quality relevant evidence to help us make the factual determinations as to whether or not the standards are met? And that's what's challenging when a elected board makes this choice because you're used to folks and being responsive to constituents telling you it's a great idea or a terrible idea. That's not the question with a quasi-judicial decision. The question is, does it meet the standards and do we have high quality, reliable evidence to support the decision we make? For in a legal context, the one thing that you're most likely to do wrong, not you individuals as a board, but as an elected board to do wrong, if you lose in court, the court is not gonna second guess your judgment. The court is gonna say, however, if you made a decision, for example, that this will not harm neighboring property values, or that it will harm neighboring property values, the court is gonna say, Mr. Town Attorney, when you're sued on this, point me to the evidence in the record that shows this will harm, have a significant adverse impact on neighboring property values. And if there's a long pause and the attorney says, well, there were a whole lot of folks who are against it, but there really isn't any evidence in the record to support the conclusion that it would harm neighboring property values, then you've got a problem because and the last point I want to make in sort of general context and, and the real reason a lot of these standards are different. If the applicant presents evidence, quality evidence that they meet the standards, they are legally entitled to their permit. You must give them the permit if they meet the standards. The contrary to that is also true. If they do not meet the standards, you cannot give them the permit. You must deny the permit if they do not meet the standards. But because they are in legally entitled to approval if they meet the standards, they have a due process right. It is a property right and you have to protect their due process rights. So these rules that we're gonna talk about next are there to protect the rights of the applicant and the rights of the neighbor to make sure there is an impartial fair process based on evidence in the record before your decision is reached. Everybody good with that so far? Okay, before the hearing. One of the rules is that you must make your decision based on evidence that is properly in the record. So you may not go out and talk with the applicant about their project meeting the applicant for breakfast and saying, tell me a little bit more about this would not be appropriate because you'd be gathering evidence outside the hearing and all of the parties have a right to hear all of the evidence that is being presented. Likewise, you can't sit down and talk with the neighbors about it prior to the hearing. Somebody calls you up 
on a Saturday afternoon and says, well, I know there's this hearing coming up. I can't be there, but let me tell you a little bit about this project. You might not hear this at the hearing, but it's important. What you have to do if, if you're presented with that situation is to say, thank you very much. I appreciate your interest, but I cannot talk to you about this case outside the hearing. You need to come to the hearing present get somebody else to come and present this information, but we need to have it in the record at the hearing, not in an informal conversation outside the hearing. It is appropriate for you to do a couple of things to be prepared. If the staff sends you a meeting packet of materials, it's perfectly appropriate for you to read that material ahead of time to look at any reports that are done that are going to be submitted as evidence so that you're prepared to ask questions about them, you're familiar with the project, that's perfectly appropriate. It's okay to do a site visit. If you wanna drive by and look at the site, perfectly fine. Do not get out and talk to the neighbors when you make the site visit, uh, but driving by and looking at it is fine. If you have personal knowledge about the site, I live four blocks from there. I've driven by it every day for the last 20 years. I know when it rains hard, it floods. That personal knowledge is fine for you to bring to bear on your decision, but you need to say it out loud at the hearing so that that information you have is in So before the hearing, just be careful not to do research. It's not appropriate for you to go on the internet and say, hey, I, I did a presentation with the Perquimans County Board when they were looking at the wind farm that's up there, the, the Amazon wind farm. They're saying, well, there's a whole lot of information about impacts of wind farms on the internet. Is it okay if we as county commissioners do some research? No. Uh, it's not okay. If the parties want to present evidence to you at the hearing about the impacts of wind farms, that's fine. But you can't go do research on your own. Your role is as a judge, not as a witness, not gathering evidence and information. Question sometimes arises, well, how about just calling the staff? Is it okay to drop by town hall and talk to the staff about this or give them a phone call and chat about it? No. Asking the staff for evidence is evidence that needs to be presented at the hearing. You can ask the staff about the ordinance. Can you explain this provision in the ordinance to me, where it came from, how it came to be? Asking about the ordinance is okay. Asking about the particular project is not. Save that question for the hearing, ask it at the hearing uh, for that. Everybody okay with things you need to do before the hearing? Yes. Okay. At the hearing, think of a court proceeding. This is a fairly formal proceeding. Witnesses present evidence under oath, subject to cross-examination. Um, unlike a rezoning hearing, people are free to exaggerate. Uh, hyperbole is not uncommon in a zoning hearing. This will be the worst thing that ever happened to our town if you were to allow it. Perfectly fine in a legislative rezoning hearing. With a quasi-judicial matter, you're getting quality at substantial, competent, material evidence this is the legal standard. So you have witnesses presenting testimony to you under oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? People have to testify based on their personal knowledge. Well, my neighbor, Mary Smith, couldn't be here tonight, but she asked me to tell you X. No. If I can testify that I saw this, facts that are in my personal knowledge, perfectly fine. The courts have said in a couple of cases, you can only consider opinion testimony if it comes from a qualified expert witness. Two critical points that that's required. Property value impacts and traffic impacts on public safety. If somebody comes in and says, this project will be a traffic, create a traffic hazard. My personal opinion is 
it's going to be awful for traffic. You cannot consider that. You cannot rely on that testimony unless they happen to be a traffic engineer who's done a study and says, based on my knowledge, experience, and studies, this is going to cause this kind of traffic problem that you can consider. If you have testimony from a real estate appraiser, an experienced real estate agent who is qualified as an expert witness uh, talking about property value impacts, you can. But even they need to have done a study. You can't have somebody come in and say, I've been selling real estate in Manio for 40 years. I know this market front and backwards, and this project would harm neighboring property values. That's my professional opinion. You'd have to say, and what do you base that professional opinion on? Have you done a study with comparables? Have you looked at similar projects, impacts on neighboring properties? You have to have a foundation for your testimony, even if you're an expert witness. Simply being an expert doesn't qualify you to offer an opinion unless you've done the appropriate foundational studies to support that decision. So those are the only two issues really, property value impacts, traffic impacts, where you need an expert witness. A neighbor- James? Yes. yes I'm Mr. here finally. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we have you on the line. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Selby, now that we have the mayor on the line, would you care to um, virtually uh, transfer the gavel to uh, mayor, mayor Owens as the presiding officer? Yes, I, I'll transfer it to the mayor who's in attendance um, as an official right, this meeting. I, well, I had the wrong number down here, but anyhow, go ahead. Whoever's ta who's talking? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have we have uh, Professor David Owens here from the School of Government. Oh, I know David. David, uh, yeah, we go way back. I'm glad he's a dare county now. Yeah, we, we do. I, I've known the mayor for, for 40 years, I think. But I have to say, yeah, my, at least. Although my go great, ahead, David. My great grandparents are from East Lake, so maybe if you go far enough back, we might be related. But <laughs> you have to go way. <laughs> okay, uh, we talked about the at the hearing. Any questions about that? Uh, one last point about at the hearing, and uh, impartiality is required. In a legislative decision, you do not have to be impartial. For a rezoning, you can say, I ran for office to prevent this sort of thing from happening in our town, and I'm voting against this rezoning. Perfectly fine. In a quasi-judicial matter, however, you have, you have an obligation to impartially apply the facts to the ordinance at hand. So if you have a predisposition, you are biased. I, this may meet the standards, but I think we should deny it. That's a problem. You may not have a bias. If you have a close relationship with one of the parties, they're a close family member, you have a close business relationship with them, or a close associational relationship. Uh, associational relationship, I once did a presentation to a board where three of the five members were members of a church that was applying for a variance. I said, they said, well, can we vote on the variance request from our church? I said, well, I, don't, I didn't want to be harsh to them. I said, maybe if, you know, if it's a 3,000 member church and you go once a year and they slap a visitor's tag on you, when you get there, that, that might be okay. And the chair of the board said, well, well no, no, I'm the chair of the building committee. In that, that case, you should not be voting on a variance for that church because the question is, would a reasonable person have grounds to wonder whether a reasonable basis for wondering whether your decision is based on the merits of the case or your relationship to the party? So you may be able to set your feelings aside and vote on a project being proposed by your spouse, but the court says we cannot assume that if it's a clo close relationship close business relationship or associational relationship, you have to abstain. And by abstaining, you actually have to recuse yourself. You must not only not vote, you must not participate in the deliberation. So don't ask questions at the hearing. My advice is 
get up and leave and come back when the case is over if you have an impermissible conflict of interest. Any questions about conduct at the hearing? What about, uh, yeah, hi, what about friends? Say, like, I, I have a friend that comes up here and doing the hearing. Sure. Um, in many towns, small and That's large, right. you're going to know the people. Area. You'll have uh, some association with them. You know them uh, on one side or the other of a case. That's fine. Okay. It, it has to be uh, with a forget the statute on relationship. It has a parent, spouse, child, grandchild, in-laws, half, that's it. A third cousin twice removed, perfectly fine. Somebody you know, I went to high school with this person. I've known them all my life. That's fine. Uh, would a reasonable person have grounds to wonder if, whether your relationship is so close that that would prevent you from making an impartial decision. And ultimately, it's the decision of the individual board member who says, I do or don't have this close of relationship. And if there's an objection about that, the rest of the board votes on whether that member can participate. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then lastly, uh, making a decision burden is on the applicant to show you they meet the standard. That's not the job of the staff. It's not your job. It's the applicant's job to produce sufficient evidence to show that they meet the standards. Once they meet that burden, you have to give them the permit. Unless folks on the other side present contrary evidence evidence that they do not meet the standards. And if there is conflicting evidence, then it's your job, much like a jury in a civil trial, to decide what the facts are. You may have one expert saying it's going to hurt property value, another expert saying no, it won't, uh, and you decide which one is right. So one of your two jobs when you make a decision is determining any facts that are contested. So if there are contested facts, you have to decide which one is correct. Which set of facts do we believe to be accurate? So job one, make sure you determine any contested facts. Then you apply those facts to the standards and you either issue the permit, you deny the permit, or you issue it with conditions. Um, you need to be very clear when you do that, which standards, particularly if you say deny a permit, which standard did not meet? And why did it not meet that standard? So if you think it's causing a harm to neighboring property values or is not harmonious with the surrounding neighborhood, you need to discuss and explain why you think that is the case. After you vote on it, your decision has to be reduced to writing that lays out not just yes or no, but yes because a, B, C, D, no because of this, or yes with these conditions. And you lay all of those out, and you have to get a written decision to the applicant within a reasonable time after you make that decision. If there is a challenge after the fact, there's never another hearing. It can go to the state Supreme Court, and there'll never be another court hearing about this case. When a court looks at the decision, it is looking at the record you establish. Somebody appeals it, they say, Mr. Manager, town attorney, wrap up this hearing record in a bow, send me the record of the evidence and the decision, and we will review it to see whether you got it right or not. And in, as I mentioned at the outset, almost always if a court reverses your decision is because there's not adequate evidence in the record to support that decision. So be careful to make sure you lay out what you decided, briefly explain why you decide that, then the gets reduced to writing, the mayor signs that, and you're done. You hopefully nobody sues you. Uh, and everybody, but it is, it is a daunting task to do a conditional use permit. Um, a 
lot of times even boards of adjustment who do this all the time struggle with getting it right because it's complicated and challenging and all kinds of big projects that have a lot of money and interest and emotion uh, behind it. Uh, so taking care to get it right because you only get one bite of this apple is critically important for you. And I guess the last thing I would say is it is very appropriate at any point if you have confusion about a legal issue to ask your town attorney about that for clarification on any legal issues before you take that action. If you got questions about the facts and you want the staff to elaborate on that at the hearing, it's always a good idea to ask the staff for additional information or analysis. If you don't think you have enough information to make a decision, you can always continue a hearing and come back to it when you have the information you need and want. Um, so being careful, relying on your professional staff, your legal advice is always good. Remembering, however, it is your obligation as a board to make the decision on contested facts and the application of the standards to that application. That said, I, I, am, I am done unless folks have additional questions or observations. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if you'd like, I can move on to agenda item number 2B. That is presentation of the fiscal year 2019-2020 audit. All right. So we have uh, we have our next our next presenter is coming to us virtually via Zoom, and in this particular case, we have a representative of the well-regarded firm Thompson Price Scott Adams and Company, PA. They're based out of Wilmington, North Carolina, and they are an audit auditing firm that is working with the town of Manio. In our particular case, case we are pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Greg Adams. Uh, Mr. Adams is a certified public accountant or CPA and he is the principal in charge of the audit for the town of Manio. Uh, Mr. Adams, we are, uh, we are prepared for you virtually and we have a, um, when you're ready, we also have a slideshow that, uh, that folks can see either in the audience or online. Uh, okay, good evening. I am Greg Adams from Thompson Price Scott Adams in Wilmington, North Carolina. <clears throat> we performed the um, audit for the town of Manio for June 30th, 2020. Um, next. Um, there are certain required communications that the auditor uh, has to uh, notify the board of. These are uh, every year, they're the same ones, uh, the 14 different things. Uh, I'm going to go through the required communications, then we'll have some uh, key figures from the audit and then any questions. Um, our responsibilities under generally accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards, OMB uh, uniform guidance, and the state single audit implementation act require us to design the audit to provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material error and in compliance with government regulations. Uh, that standard was accomplished. There were no material errors. We're also required to communicate uh, and uh, all planned procedures and have complete access to both management and information. And if that wasn't the case, we would note we would have to notify the board of that of that that was completed and our work was not limited in any way. Uh, communicate significant deficiencies in internal control. <clears throat> I think this is a common deficiency in towns uh, of the size of Manio, which is segregation of duties which just means there's not enough staff to segregate all the duties uh, that, the, that the town has in the accounting cycles to provide adequate segregation of duties. Next. Um, we, are, we are also required to notify the town of any adoption or changes in accounting policies. So if there was a significant uh, change, say for leases, which is I think next year's um, change. So if the town had, several leases, there's going to be a change in how those leases are accounted for. Uh, those, those would be notified to you right here, and I would let you know what that, what the effect on the financial statement was of those changes. This year, there were none. 
um, supposed to assess and let you know um, that the methods used for estimates were reasonable. The main estimates for the town would be allowance for doubtful accounts of your accounts receivable. So on an amount you set aside that you don't uh, deem collectible and depreciation. And those were uh, both uh, reasonable, both of those um, significant areas. Um, we would also notify you of any significant audit adjustments if we had to make a significant audit adjustment or any unrecorded differences. If we came up uh, with a, a balance that was 10 and you guys had the balance at nine and we decided not to, 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 to make an adjustment, we passed on the adjustment, that unrecorded difference that I would have to let you know about. There were none. Uh, next, number five, disagreements with management. If uh, we would um, have to, if we we would have to communicate, excuse me, any disagreements on the financial reporting matters uh, that were not resolved. So if we had a, if we going back to the allowance for doubtful accounts for your receivables, if we thought the allowance for doubtful accounts should increase by ten thousand, but management felt like five thousand uh, was the appropriate number, and we disagreed about that, we would have to let you know about that. There were none of those. Any consultations, number six, any consultations with other accountants or really any consultations with any outside experts. If we used an IT expert to analyze your uh, computer system or any kind of uh, uh, a fraud expert or uh, actuary, any of those outside experts, if we, if we used one, we'd have to let you know about it. There were none. Were there any major issues with management that we discussed prior to us signing the contract, prior to our retention? We'd have to uh, let you know about those issues. There were none. Next. Were there any serious um, difficulties uh, encountered during the audit? Um, unreasonable delays in providing needed information that would be on the town side, unreasonable timetable or unav unavailability of client personnel. There were none. The only delays that we had or difficulties were on the uh, audit firm's end. We had three, I think, positive tests since November. Uh, a death of a, a spouse and a divorce. So the, all those things kind of set us back a little bit, um, which is why the audit was delayed a little bit this year uh, for on our end. Um, number nine, irregularities and illegal acts. We would have to communicate the existence of any material irregularities and or illegal acts determined during the audit. There were none reported. In the general fund, the key figures, Total revenues for the year ended up at $4,349,680. We had total expenditures of $4,163,206. So a net change or increase of fund balance in the general fund of $186,474. The local government commission has determined that 8% of your general fund expenditures uh, they want you to have as your unassigned fund balance. 8% is 1 12th. One twelfth is one month's expenditures, so they want you to have at least um, an undesignated fund balance, unassigned fund balance, one month's expenditures. That that calculation comes out to be three hundred and thirty-three thousand fifty-six dollars. Um, your unassigned fund balance is four million six hundred and fifteen thousand six hundred and eighty dollars. So that 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 one twelfth is eight percent of your general fund expenditures, and you have one hundred and ten point eight seven percent. The state average on the LGC website, you can search by population. So the population of Manio falls into a, the category that the state average of that fund balance number is 82.39. So Manio is 110.87, well above the state average for municipalities of your size at 82.39. The overall tax collection rate was 98.73% with the state average, again, of the same population, 98%. Next. This is a graph, we just had two years worth of data. I can get some more data in there next year and show, so we'll have some more prior year's audits. But you, <clears throat> you can kind of see with the red is the total fund balance. And then the reserve or restricted fund balance is the orange, which uh, comes, the total fund balance comes in at a little over almost 6.1 million. And then the reserved or uh, fund balance, which is usually the most, the biggest thing is reserved by state statute, which is a calculation the state gives us to make. Basically, it's your receivables 
uh, 1,482,148. So the difference would be that unassigned fund balance that we talked about on the previous slide. Next. This is just the total cash that the town of Manio had at June 30th, 2020. So 2019 was $6,017,687. And that in 2020, $6,313,854. So that also kind of, that's a little bit like 200 and some thousand, which that kind of equates to our increase in fund balance, which is 185,000. Next. This is that fund balance percentage as it relates to the last two years, where last year we were at 123.38. And even though we had an increase in fund balance, Sometimes that is driven by receivables. So the, the overall fund balance is still excellent at 110.87, but went down a little bit as a, as a percentage of your expenditure. So either the expenditures went up and or some more was reserved from the fund balance in, in terms of the state reserve for state stabilization. Um, again, next year, I'll, I'll try to get some more back audits so we can have a better graph. Uh, next. This is the water and sewer fund. Um, uh, total revenues, 2,041,141. Uh, total expenditures, 1,817,940. So an increase, a positive increase, a net increase of $223,201. A fund balance at the beginning of the year. And there's no real calculation for the fund balance. They just want you to, you know, it's, it's, it's a for-profit type of thing at the water and sewer. So we should, as long as we're showing positive, uh, that's what the LGC is concerned about. We're at 6.8 million in fund balance. And then at the end of the year, 7 million. So that includes the $223,201 increase for the year. Next. Uh, we appreciate it. And we thank the town staff, which was excellent while we were there on site. Um, we, we apologize for the, the delay. It's still gonna be on time. Uh, the, the extended, the due date for all these audits this year till January 31st. I think the town is in the process of reviewing everything. Um, That's the town staff, um, which was we're excellent to work with. And as soon as we get back the uh, draft that you have, we'll go ahead and submit that. And then as soon as the LGC approves it, we'll get you your copies. Are there any questions? Uh, Greg, this is a now. Uh, so the overall, we're we're looking pretty good with this yes. uh, with this audit. Everything yes, looks good, and we're, we're in good financial shape. Yes, sir. They're real good. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you, if it's all right with you, would you like me to proceed with uh, the next items on? Oh this? yeah, go ahead. I, I was, uh, who was, uh, was, is Betty online? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Selby's on the line. Did she started to meet? No. Uh, have we got a major votes tonight? Uh, no, sir. We only have we only have one actual vote later. That's under item four, old business. This is the acceptance of the hundred fifty thousand dollar grant for the town of, town common phase two. Oh yeah. Well, I wouldn't be able to vote anyhow. Well, Betty's got to be able to vote, so uh, I'll just go. I was going to let her just keep right on with the meeting as pro tem. But uh, I'll just go ahead and take over. If Betty doesn't mind. Then. Betty. Hello. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I, we'd heard the uh, the Mayor Pro Tem handing uh, handing uh, the the gavel back uh, back to you. So I understand you're you're still presiding. And uh, and is it if it's all right with you? Okay, that's all right. Okay, go. I just wanted to know I was going to make it easy on everybody. Go ahead with the next uh, say, uh, uh, presentation, James. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, uh, for our listening public, uh, item number two, presentation reports also include some uh, some items that are being done by staff and items C, D, E, and F. We have a, a short slideshow here that will just pr provide some highlights to folks. And uh, we'll go ahead and get that up on the screen for those who are participating by Zoom. Okay. So the first item is a, is a quick, um, we've got a quick update here. 
and this is on the uh, this is on the downtown associate community program. Um, we are this is this is a program that the folks have heard heard a good a good bit about here. Um, we'll go ahead to the next slide. And in this and in this particular case, we the, the folks the folks who have uh, been following our progress with the downtown associate community program. This is a program offered by the North Carolina Department of Commerce. It's actually run by Commerce's Main Street and Rural Planning Center. And the reason it's part of that center is the DAC program is our pathway to the Main Street America program. It's traditionally a three-year program for small towns to be able to hit the Main Street program. Um, the goal of this program is really economic development in the context of historic preservation. One of the things that's really important for us that we keep messaging each time though, is that it's called the Downtown Associate Community Program. But in our particular case, given the layout of our town, this program and our implementation of it is designed to help businesses and residents in the community throughout the town. It's not just limited to a downtown area. So I wanna make sure we emphasize that with those who are listening. Now, in terms of our path forward, we're really excited after having some COVID related delays where the state folks were not allowed to travel and were obliged to push some of these things off, we are getting started. So the state kickoff meeting is going to occur next week, January 27th at 4 o'clock p.m. And given travel restrictions, it is going to happen virtually. We're going to have a Zoom conference. We've already put the word out on it, and we're going to continue to put the word on it. So either online and watch, or they can go by video if they prefer to just call in. Now, we will continue to put that out. It's on social media pages, but we want to make it easy for folks to find the information. We're even putting out agendas, slideshows, so those folks who, who can't see it virtually, they can still have the materials right in front of them as they listen in. And we've made a little, uh, just a, a sub page here on the website. Folks can go to manionc.gov forward slash DAC. So again, that's manionc.gov forward slash DAC. Now the January meeting is the first, it's the kickoff. It's the informational session so folks can really get an understanding for the program. They have a chance to meet virtually with our the folks at the state who are going to be guiding us through this and providing all the feedback and guidance and access to resources. And we'll actually now, we wanna to get to keep the momentum going. So you'll see on our calendar for 2021, we'll have meetings every other month. So we've got it up here, January, March, May, July, September, and November. And each time we'll make sure to get a link out to the public, uh, website, um, social media, and all the rest. So we wanna make sure folks save the date, January 27th, four o'clock. And if you go to manionc.gov forward slash DAC, you will see all the information as we continue to collect in that place. So that's our update on the downtown community program. Any questions from the board before I head to the next topic? I wanted to say um, I'm up here, Mayor, My somehow my iPad got jammed up. <laughs> well, I was asking for you, Betty, but you didn't. Uh, that, you're on now. Uh, yeah, it got messed up. Okay. All right. Um, All right, James, go ahead. Next item is an update on the recycling program transition. Now, in this case, and the recycling program transition has been discussed for, for many months here at the town, uh, stretching back all the way to, to 2020, last year. And as we move to the next slide, we have a little bit of information, folks, on this transition. So as we go back to the way it was done previously in 2017 and prior, it was a subscription-based system for folks who went ahead and signed up with Bay Disposal to do it. So what we have, we've continued to push out information I'll share later all the ways we try to push it out. But we're converting to that system as previously announced. By the end of the month, folks, if folks want to do the roll cart recycling at the curbside, they need to call Bay Disposal. But we didn't want to just say call Bay Disposal. We got an actual customer service lead. Well, we're putting, we continue to put out there that person is Katie Beasley at Bay Disposal and her, and her phone number, we get her direct line is 252-491. 5105 extension 351. Now we, we want folks who do want to continue with the program to call her by the end of the month. Uh, now this service will cost 1135 per month. Um, that's for weekly service with the yellow top roll carts. And they, they at Bay Disposal will, will send out bills to, to folks each quarter. Now for those who don't want to opt into this, they, they'll start picking up carts. We just got late breaking news this afternoon from Bay that they plan to start picking up uh, the unused roll carts 
starting Friday, February 5th. So anybody who, who decides not to uh, opt into the service can just put their roll card out uh, and then start getting picked up that day. And depending on the number of carts, so they may bleed into the next week for that those pickups around town. Now, for those who prefer to do group recycling and go to, to recycling convenience centers, we've got a couple of options. For the rest of our fiscal year until June 30th, we have recycling containers right here at Town Hall. So they're in the side parking lot with the entrance off Budley Street. Uh, that's one lot option for folks. We've got a couple of containers out there right now. Or folks for the permit uh, for folks looking for a permanent solution there, Deer County uh, has a recycle their permanent recycling center that's 1018 Driftwood Drive. And they have uh, they've got a pretty wide variety of hours of operation. But of course, since that's a Dare County operation, we would refer folks to darenc.com. Uh, of course, folks here that live in the town of Manio are also county residents. So of course you have access to those, to those services. Now, from a communications perspective, uh, we I'd actually heard from two people in, in the neighborhood in which I live, and they they both said, well, we hadn't heard anything about it. So I wanted to share with the, with the board, and if the board has any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. So our communications on this topic have included public meetings over, um, well, public meetings over about nine month period, newspaper ads, water notices on water bills, a hard copy things in kiosks. So not everybody's on the computer, so we put in hard copy in the kiosks and notices and website, uh, both in the news section and uh, as well as the town manager updates, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we've also just recently, uh, as part of a suggestion from one of, one of our, our, our neighbors, was to send it out on the regroup, the text and email notification system. Uh, we also sent it out to what's called the Sunshine List. And that's a list where members of the public, members of the press, they can talk to the town clerk and say, you've got notices going out, just add me to the list. So we've done a, a extensive outreach to try and continue to get with people. And there may be a few people who are, who are maybe thinking that we're over communicating, but even if we hear one person saying they haven't heard, we're trying our best to get the word out to, to everybody in the community. Now, one last bit, this is also uh, some, some related news. Um, the representative from Bay Disposal assured me today, this isn't just for residents. If a business or commercial operation wants to have the convenience of a roll cart at their location, they can also call that number and get the service at their, at their business location. Same price, same frequency, once a week. Um, and again, that's Bay Disposal at 252-491-5105, extension 351. Any suggestions or feedback from the board before I go to the next topic? What, what was that number again, James? This is Daryl. Yes, sir. That is 252-491-5105. And uh, the person, that we, the direct person who's been assigned this, her name is Katie Beasley, and she's at extension 351. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so moving on, this is an update on the Marshes Light Boardwalk. This is another topic that has come up over a period, has come up over a period of time. Um, we, what we'll have here on the first slide is what was brought to the to the Board of Commissioners by a group of residents at Marshes Light. So the next slide will show a map, and this is the map provided by the residents, and it shows a section. And this is important for folks who can actually see the map if they're on Zoom or in person. The map shows two colors. First in orange, it's showing the section of boardwalk that the residents proposed to have taken over by the town. And they go from the net shed and go around the undeveloped, undeveloped property there um, all the way toward the, toward the marsh area and the detention pond that has the little beach there. So it terminates at the little beach and the little stairway, and then it connects back up to the parking area. So that's the area in orange. We also have on the map circled in yellow, just, pat, just at the end of this boardwalk section, there is an undeveloped section that was currently listed as being for uh, retail or perhaps mixed use. So that circle in yellow. So as we get later in the presentation, I'll refer to the main section of boardwalk as being highlighted in orange and then a potential, uh, potential site in yellow. So as we go to the next slide, I will recap from, for those who weren't at the, prior, the various prior meetings. In terms of cost, so we did have the engineering analysis performed by a licensed professional engineer experienced in marine structures and indicated the, board, the boardwalk is in fair condition, but the bulkhead and breakwater were at end of life. So the short-term cost for this particular project to repair both the boardwalk and the bulkhead 
was just under 500,000. It was uh, the report notes $482,000. And he thought his, his, his opinion was it really needed to be done in the next, within the next two or three years. Also, to identify not just short-term costs, if, it was, if this was considered, is the long-term cost to the taxpayers. So if the boardwalk and bulkhead were replaced now at this time, then we still needed to budget for future maintenance and replacement. And his estimate was for us to budget 35,000 a year for future repairs and replacement. So that's kind of the cost estimate we've got. As we go to the next slide, the additional information is we go from cost to legal topics. And we had shared with the public before. On the right side of the slide, we talked about the CAMA, they, we got a picture of the CAMA permit plan that was submitted by the developers as they, as they have applied for to the state, not yet to the town, for an expansion of the marina and installation of a bulkhead. Uh, as you can, comparing it to the prior map, the, even though this particular development, um, development and additional developments, it's not part of the boardwalk itself, there would be required access over the section of boardwalk that they had proposed to turn over to the town, right by the little beach and the stairway there. So things like cross easements and such would have to be considered. On the left side of the screen, we had provided previously some, some of the, the recorded easement and also the conditional use permit language that relates to the use of this. So in terms of, I'll, I'll read from these documents. Um, first of all, they, we are, the town of Manio already has a 30 foot wide easement and is dedicated as a public park in perpetuity. In other words, the public will always, and even in the current scenario, will always have access to this boardwalk. That's a condition. Um, and it's recorded. It also, it also uh, later in that section, talks that the park and the boardwalk shall be maintained by developers slash homeowners. And that, that's also <laughs> in that language. On a related note, that, that same language is reinforced in the other recorded documents, um, where it goes on to say, uh, grantor and, or, and its successors and assigns, including any association of property owners in the development of Marsh's Light, shall be responsible for the maintenance, repair, and any necessary replacement of those improvements to the boardwalk easement. So those are some of the legal topics that we have broached previously to kind of give the context of what rights we have now versus what might happen later. As we go to the next slide, we, uh, the board had asked me to go ahead and, and confer with the developer. So I was able to meet with the, the resident representative who had appeared before the board, as well as a representative of the developer. And of course, it's subject to, to their approval. But what was, I was asked to say, what is their proposal? Let's be specific and hear from the developer in this case. So um, in general, I don't like to read directly from slides, but for our listening public, I wanna give them the four main points that were confirmed with the developer as what their, what their proposal is. So first, the developer would convey to the town the section of boardwalk this was a section that was highlighted in orange on the prior map, but it extends from the town's ownership at the net shed all the way to the little, to the little beach section that where it, the, the boardwalk um, it, it goes next to the condos there. Number two, the developer would turn that retail cottage area that was circled in yellow on the map into a park. Now, they said that was conditional on being able to make up the loss of that unit on the other side of the pond, in other words, elsewhere on the site. And they also said there may be an option for another park or playground elsewhere off the Marsh's Light site. Number three, they, the ongoing maintenance of the boardwalk would continue until the conveyance of the property to the town. So in other words, now if they have say a, a board or something needs to be replaced now, they would perform that, that, that typical maintenance now. Um, that was, uh, that was um, but they just said that's the normal wear and tear, the daily wear and tear. And fourth, the developer in the town would coordinate on connections from the property to the boardwalk as well as activities along the property frontage. In this particular case, the developer wanted to make sure that we'd be able to cooperate because as they develop out that area with whatever is permitted in the future, they wanted to make sure they had the ability to connect up to the boardwalk or that big trees were planted right in front of their, you know, their buildings, things like that. So, um, so they, they specify that we would not want to coordinate on those connections. So that is the latest information we have from, uh, from the Marsh's Light developer. And uh, we wanted to make sure though, again, being very public and, and, and transparent in this, we wanted to share that with the board. Um, I, under, I understand no action is needed at the time, but we wanna make sure to share that you know, as soon as we had the next available workshop meeting. So any questions from the board for, on this particular segment? This is Richie, yes, I have a question about this. 
<clears throat> I see the highlighted area ongoing and maintenance of the boardwalk would continue. Is the, that does not include the cost of the new uh, bulkhead that needs to be done. No, sir, that would not include the the replacement of the either the boardwalk or bulkhead or those items that had been established in the port as with an estimate of 482,000 by the engineer. And maybe the, can you back it up a scene, please? And um, I couldn't really see it. There's a permit out there from for camera. Are they extending the boardwalk over there? Uh, in this particular case, so the, the what we're what we're showing is, and this was shown in a prior meeting, the the developer has applied for a camera permit to expand the marina and add add a uh, add in a breakwater area. However, they're not actually extending a, a the boardwalk. It's actually just a break. A, there's a section here where there's a breakwater and there's a section where they're extending their own boardwalk which they would maintain okay. and add a kayak launch and access to the other slips uh, i know those were on the line can't see it but i'm just going to quickly go point those out on the screen so break water or wave attenuator okay and this segment is access to boardwalk or walkway access to these new slips so that's, that's, new. Kayak launch. that's not so that's new boardwalk going out that new boardwalk is going out. That that new boardwalk comes from if you walk the boardwalk and uh, um, as you turn the corner there, obviously. But uh, uh -huh. you know the beach is in there. And okay. Then, yep. As you leave the cove, that boardwalk would extend out up. straight, and then the attenuator. But you know what area is close to where that new boardwalk would be. Yes, yeah. I I can point that on the screen. So the question here is, does their new boardwalk tie into ours? And I'm going to show on the screen, it doesn't tie into ours, but for them to build it, they need access over what they're proposing to convey. So what I'm going to go up is show where the yellow circle was previously and show the connection. So there, yeah, uh, Woody has the yellow, the yellow section here was, was the proposed park area. Here's where the boardwalk would terminate, right here by near the condos, and, oops, and, that, little, and that little beach, there's a little beach right about there. Mm -hmm. So they would not convey to the town hall that either this existing in front of the condos or the new section proposed for the marina expansion of the way. But it will be connected to the existing boardwalk. It would, it would be connected, yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> this is Eddie. I have a question. It may be irrelevant, but uh, the new thing they proposed with Canva, that kayak launch, would uh, the public be able to access that or is that just to private residents? Yes, sir. Uh, oh, in, in, the, in the information provided us by the developer, they didn't specify whether that was for public use, but we also have our town planner here who may be able to provide some information because that has, that we, although we have not received a building permit or a town permit application, that's why it has not come before you or our planning and zoning board. However, we may have information uh, that uh, from CAMA via the town planner. And I, uh, well, at, the, at the lectern is the town planner, Melissa Dickerson. Thank you, um, town manager Ayers. And Commissioner Mann, it's my understanding, and I don't have the document in front of me, but I believe that may have been a condition in the conditional use permit. Um, so I, I believe the answer is yes, that that would be for public use. Um, just as the playground and a, pl a playground on the park on site would be um, required in the conditional use permit as well. Okay, thank you. That was just a guess. I, I'm going to pull up the document and confirm oh, that for you. Okay. Um, but I, I wanted to respond <laughs> and no, let no, you know that I'm going to take a look. Yeah. Great. I have a question or comment on that too. You know, there's already the easement, so it's already public use of the boardwalk um you know should the boardwalk which needs significant work in the next few years as we pointed out right um should that not be able to get done and the boardwalk becomes a liability and falls in disrepair um you know what's the obligation to <laughs> keep it safe from march's light or say we can't keep this safe and we need to fence it off and you know, shut down the boardwalk type thing. Um, thank you, thank you, Commissioner Borland. That's a that's a great that's a great question. Um, and 
I'm you, it, for those who are in the audience could probably can see me <laughs> looking across at our town attorney, Ben Gallup. I don't know if the town attorney is prepared to respond to that or if it's something that we should take under advisement and provide feedback to the board. I mean, I think the basic answer is probably under this easement provision that they have duty for repair and that it, if it got to the point where it was dangerous and you didn't want the public on it, then you might be able to enforce something under an easement to make them have to pay to repair it. I mean, it, there's a number of different ways to deal with it. Um, uh, and, and there's also the question of whether or not it just being a public whether or not there is any liability, but there probably probably would be treated similar to a sidewalk. Um, but I'd have to think about it a little bit. It's a little bit different than a road or a sidewalk in, in the way it's set up. So that may limit your liability as well. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to just kind of mention, um, you know, on, on the call here, um, we talked about this a little bit and you know, we're not, we didn't advise James to go into an open negotiation really. Um, and I just wanna make sure that's clear. We, you know, we kind of went out and said, we're open to discussing this, give us your offer. Um, and obviously, um, I mean, I'll say it, 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 I'm not blown away from this and it didn't, doesn't seem to work. It, it's tough to go over to the folks in Pirates Cove and the West side who are paying taxes and say, hey, we need, we're taking on this $500,000 project. Um, and, you know, so it, it's, it's a little bit underwhelming at, at first look. I know we're not making a decision on there, but, you know, I want to point that out that we're not in an open negotiation here. This was asking for the best offer and that's what we're looking at essentially. Uh, this is Daryl. Has there been any talk about maybe uh, uh, the association to repair the boardwalk, or maybe partner up with us repairing, helping prepare the boardwalk when I spend that kind of money uh, for them to do it, and then we'll take it over? Uh um, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for for the question. Um, when, uh, and then to Commissioner Borland's point, I was directed just to, to ask them specifically, what is their specific offer to 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 the town? And that's what they provided. And there was no in, no indication that the developer would would um, put the boardwalk in a, a new condition or to perform those uh, repairs and replacements deemed necessary by the uh, the engineer who did the assessment. Um, and there's no there's no grant money available to to assist the homeowners. Unfor unfortunately, we um, we actually we have we've been looking at grant money and also the the FEMA issue. Uh, for those who were listening before, we did talk to FEMA, and FEMA did indicate that they did not they could not provide if a hurricane hit it, they couldn't provide that money to a private entity in terms of repair of it. So that was one of the reasons it took cause to look at it. Um, in terms of grants, the town was able to get a camera grant this pay, that, that was uh, put in place and the boardwalk that the town owned uh, did receive new decking and related materials earlier this year. In fact, that was finished off in the early parts of the pandemic uh, as construction was allowed uh, under the governor's order, public works construction. Um, but unfortunately, and our, our, our assessment in, 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 uh, in looking at the available grants wouldn't cover that entire thing. It would it would cover some access, some the, like the redecking we did for a portion. Uh, in our particular case, we did have a six-figure re redecking, uh, but we also did it on uh, on existing piles and existing uh, existing stringers. In this case, they're talking about redoing the entire, having to do both the bulkhead as well as the decking and related items. So there is there's definitely a, a difference between the two um, the two types of projects. Oh. I mean, this, this is Betty. I, I got a question, and I and I've been listening, trying to follow along here. So what what they want us to do is all the repair work. Is that correct? I'm I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro. I know you don't have the uh, the the slides in front of you, uh, or maybe you do. I'm not sure how what we've got going on with Zoom, uh, Betty. So let me recap, and maybe I'll let James if I'm wrong here, but the. The immediate short-term cost for repairs is about $500,000 that we would have to take on it. Um, and then 
um, the findings were $35,000 a year put aside, and that wouldn't necessarily need to get used every year, but that would do repairs every year and then fund an account to take care of the boardwalk uh, long term. So that, does that recap well, on? Yeah, but I guess my question is, why won't, with the homeowners association and things like that, why won't they bring it up the standards? before we take it over. I and mean, I know why, because I've been listening to the conversation, but I, I just have a question or a problem with that. Maybe we all do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, we that, gotta do some more discussion. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I think, Betty. We're, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. I think, James, you're getting in over your head now. This yes. is just up for discussion. It sounds to me like we're getting ready to turn it down or approve it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, the, this, this item was uh, is for is for information. Um, at, we do the, the town planner also. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, sir. and I, and we're we're happy to bring this back to the board for their actual consideration and gather any information, other information they want. Um, if it's all right with Mr. Mayor, two quick two quick items of one of procedure and one of response. Uh, the town planner has pulled up in response to an earlier question to to um, to one of our commissioners. That section 8F in the CUP calls for a playground, but it does not mention a kayak. And town planner was able to look that up while we were while we were speaking. Also, in a point of procedure, we did have a member of the audience raise uh, raise to ask a question. I know that's not it's not typical. I'm sorry, it's 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 not the it's not the uh, the Roberts Rule of Orders. I have members of the audience asking questions. If but I don't know if you want to suspend the rules or if we would ask our member of the audience who's here to perhaps. Uh, make a public comment, which will be the next section after this. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm well, just, that's up to the board. Whatever the board decides, I don't have any objections to it. I don't know what they want to talk about it anyhow. Okay. Okay. That money. Is that correct? All right. So, so, Mr. Mr. Mayor, the, the the question was whether the the ownership of the the ownership of the boardwalk impacts uh, impacts the ability to apply for grants or whether it's FEMA reimbursement. And we'd established that before that FEMA will not reimburse the Marshes Life Property Owners Association if a hurricane hit it. No, you know the one federal federal and state government's not going to go in and help a private entity. No way. No shape. No form. No fashion. Yes, sir. Great, thank you, sir. Um, so, and we're we're happy to bring this was again just an update based on what the board had directed before, and we we'll, we can come back and have it on a future agenda should you choose to do so. To provide that's, that's what I that's what I think we ought to do, James, is take it under advisement, discuss it because this is going to be a long range discussion. It sounds like yes, sir. Would I don't think we're ready. For, we're not ready for any decisions tonight, and we're getting way ahead of ourselves. I think. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're happy to come back with with additional information should the board should the board ask for it because there would be other decision points should they want to move forward with it. So we're happy to bring that back. Well, uh, you James, are you keeping up with their camera permit? You're not, are you? Yes, sir. We had we had brought at the prior update. We had noted that the um, is that the camera permit was noted. The town received notice of the camera permit as an adjacent landowner. And we had shown you've, that you've uh, got uh, 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 you've got what they want to do. Then you've already got their proposal from Cama. We we did see their permit to Cama. The one thing I'd caution the audience about is that even though a permit goes to Cama, it hasn't yet appeared before the town. So if it, when it comes to the town, we'll make sure to be very transparent and share with the public what board it will presumably first go to planning and zoning board. Yeah, that's right. We'll make that's sure right. The public inform. Okay. Uh, so next up. Uh, next up is the uh, is the update on the town common. This particular one, I for, I'm I have to have to say I'm pretty excited about this project, and I'm also uh, sad for those who are only able to come online, but for, or come on audio. So those who can't see these these pictures, we're happy to share them with you by email or whatever. So um, let's our first slide talks a little bit about this project schedule and some related news. So in terms of project schedule, we have some really key dates and milestones here. Of course, the project uh, did start October 2020, and we handled all the appropriate things, everything from notice of award to contract execution. And of course, the contractor got their notice to proceed and mobilize to the project. 
Now, our next really big milestone, it's the parking, the parking lot. We wanted to get that first as early as possible. And that one, we had a milestone in the contract in February 2021. And after our construction progress meeting this past week, we do expect that to be met. Um, we also have another mile, a big milestone after that, and that's the park area. I mean, this the, the key part of this thing is to have a you know, have a park area, walking site features, and that one is supposed to it was projected to be done by the end of April. And right now, based on the current schedule uh, done by the contractor, they expect to meet that as well. Um, Hello. Yes, sir. Um, we're still here. Hello. All Hello. Right. Hey. And, yeah. Yep. Dolly, I'm in a board meeting on the telephone. I'll call you later. Okay. So um, in, related, in related news, the contractor, RPC, was purchased by Rose Brothers Paving. Now, I can assure the public we already had in place appropriate contract language, bonds, insurance, etc. But as part of this transition, we're working very close, closely with them to make sure all those things are handled. And the transition is well in progress. And, and good news is additional resources have been brought to bear. So this transition is proceeding and they're making good progress on the work is appropriate. In fact, for those who have gone down there uh, and driven by, they may have seen uh, actual Rose Brothers trailers and equipment and people coming on board to, to help us get the resources we need. So I am pleased with that, uh, with that progress there. Now, one thing to say it on paper, it's another thing to show some pictures. So let me go ahead to the next slide. The first slide here, this was taken just before Thanksgiving. This is actually an aerial photo taken of the site. And what we show here, and remember, we started the project in October, here just before Thanksgiving, the thing's starting to take shape. It's showing mass grading, earthwork, and activities going on here. You can start seeing the parking bays take shape as well as the area coming up by the, by the park, as well as the entrances, because this course has two entrances, one coming in off Ludley Street and one going out on Ananias there. Now that's the, that's around Thanksgiving in November. The next slide we're gonna have a couple, a few slides here taken here in January. The first one shows that they made great progress on the site utilities, both dry utilities and wet utilities. What I mean by that, dry utilities are traditionally things like, and what we can see in the photo here is the installation of conduits and electrical infrastructure, so we can have light poles and things like that in place. And that's that's the shot here. Um, wet utilities. They also we also have some wet utilities on site water, sewer, things like that. We need to have that not just now as we work with our water system, but also to stub out for future use on the property. Things like the phase two restrooms to have water and sewer service. Let's put it in the ground now and not have to cut anything up later. And that, is, uh, that work has been completed. Uh, and the electrical, the electrical wiring is in the only things that remain there are the installation of the light poles, which did arrive this week, as well as bollard lights and other types of features. Now, moving from utilities onto the next slide, we'll actually see um, the, the crew that came in after utilities came in, we're showing uh, our, uh, our top con la laser level here as the crews for the concrete crews were forming up curb in this particular case along Ananias there, but they had good equipment, hard working crews, and they got, they got the curb, curb areas formed up. And now this is forming. If you go to the next slide, we actually see the concrete curb has been placed looking good. You see the islands, uh, you see the uh, parking areas starting to take place. Uh, this is also a shot from the Ananias Dare side, but anybody that's gone there in the last few days will see it's not just concrete down, it's not just concrete curb down, you'll actually see rock going in our, our aggregate base course, as well as grading in the, uh, in the parking bays and the drive aisles here. So this is a really exciting development, and this also tells me that what we heard in our progress meeting does make sense, absent very poor weather or, you know, some, some other terrible event that they look like they will meet their schedule for the parking areas. Now, as we go to the last slide in this, in this thing, this is actually a picture. And this picture is a, rent, is a rendering. Some of you may have seen it if you were going by the site, but this is on the park area. Now, remember the park area, the landscaping shouldn't be done in the flat for the parking. So the last thing you wanna do is have a site and people are running over trees and shrubs and things like that. So getting the, park, getting the parking done first, then do the, the light grading, the, landscaping and this is based on the actual landscape architects plan a little aerial view um, and this this is this is not what it looks like today but this is what we hope for for the future an area that is well landscaped has walking areas seating areas and all, as well as site fe features ranging from uh, things things like bicycle racks uh, bicycle repair station uh, kiosk um, we're going to eventually we're going to have kiosks and of course phase two as we roll into that 
later in the agenda that will add additional facilities to the site. But over time, what you see here, uh, we want to make sure this is a place both for our residents to enjoy here in the town and uh, pr presumably we may have some visitors coming here as well. So this should be good for the entire community. And we'll make sure to share this out on the website. It's on the site right now on a sign. And we wanna let folks know that we are really excited about the progress of the town common. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my, re my report and updates for the Board of Commissioners. All right. Uh, now, everybody's got the department head reports. Uh, so, uh, Public comment period. Yes, sir. And if, if if you if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, I'd say follow us uh, just a few minutes here. I know department head reports are available online. Uh, we have it at manionc.gov. But this month, like we've done, done some other months, we do have a spotlight department, so we can let the public know what's going on behind the scenes. And if it's all right with you, yeah, go ahead. Three minute. Go video. ahead. Thank you, sir. Our IT department head, Carl Woody, is going to play a video. And it, this will also be a, uh, be available to the public for those who are on audio only right now. Mr. Woody, if you can Here at the town of Mania, we spent the last couple of years upgrading our technology infrastructure to provide better service for our staff, community, and visitors. One of these services is the free Wi-Fi that is available around the town of Mania. Originally, we had Wi-Fi for some of the docks located at the marina. As part of the Wi-Fi upgrade, we replaced that equipment and added new equipment for the Waterfront Pavilion, the Waterfront Playground, the George Washington Creef Park, the Roanoke Maritime Museum, the Magnolia Pavilion, Cartwright Park, and finally the Pea Island Cookhouse Museum. When you are connected to the free Wi-Fi service, you can expect around a 20 meg download speed. To find out the exact location of the free Wi-Fi service, you can visit our website ManioNC.gov under the Information Technology section. Speaking of websites, we have redesigned and published the new town's website, ManioNC.gov. During this process, we wanted each department to tell their story. What does that department do and what services do they provide for the community and visitors? We have received multiple compliments from staff and the community on the website structure on how easy it is now to find the information. We also deployed a second website called discovermanio.com. This website is geared toward the community and visitors. When visiting this website, you will find a list of places to stay, where to eat and drink, where to shop, and what type of activities that are available in and around the town of Manio. During the design of the town's new website, we found out that the most popular pages are public cameras. We have upgraded the cameras at the Marina and Queen Elizabeth Avenue. We have also added a new camera that overlooks the lighthouse and shallow bag bay. All the cameras are available on our website or you can go to our YouTube channel. We encourage you to go to youtube.com and search for the town of Mania and click the subscribe button. As we all know, the weather can get tricky around here. To help with that weather issue, you can get real time updates from our website. We have installed one weather station at Town Hall and a second is planned for Pea Island Cookhouse Museum. We have also performed some back-end upgrades that are not typically visible to the public. We have migrated all of our cell service to FirstNet. The FirstNet mission is to deploy, operate, maintain, and improve the first high-speed nationwide wireless broadband network for first responders and public safety. One of these features is that if cell service goes down during a weather event, we can request that FirstNet bring in a portable tower and provide service for first responders and then the community. Finally, we have partnered with Dare County, which provided the town with a secure, safe, and reliable location for our servers. Many may not know, but Manio Town Hall used to be a bank and the server room was a closet on the second floor. By working with Dare County, we were able to relocate our servers to the Emergency Operations Center. This will help the town maintain its network resilience to critical services during a weather or emergency event. For more information, you can visit manionc.gov. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity for, to give our, 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 member, our members of the public opportunity to see what's going on behind the scenes with, with our IT department. 
if it's all right with you, I'll proceed to item three, public comment. And yeah, I can... go... Yeah, you. go ahead. Thank you, sir. So our directions to, to folks, we have both in-person as well as virtual folks. So we'll, we'll, we want to tell all of you, members of the public are invited to address the Board of Commissioners on any topic. Public comment is not intended to require the board to answer any impromptu questions or to take any action on items brought up during the public comment period. Speakers will address all the comments to the board as a whole and not one individual commissioner. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Time limits are three minutes per person or five minutes per group. Please identify yourself and location so that your statements can be recorded. But we'll start here, Mr. Mayor, in Town Hall. We do have some members of the public present and we'll see if, if, if they would like to uh, come to the lectern and make any public comments. Okay, um, seeing the answer is no, Mr. Mayor, what we'll do is we'll go to our, our listening public and for any of the attendees that are out there, you can, you can raise your hand virtually by hitting star nine on your phone to raise your hand. So anybody who would like to make a public comment, this is your time. If you hit star nine, you'll, with the, the IT department head will unmute you and you'll have an opportunity to speak. All right, we have members of the public, but nobody's raised their hand at this point. Uh, if you want to hit star nine on your phone. And a third time, if anybody in the public would like to make a public comment, if you hit star nine, it'll raise your hand and we'll recognize you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, it looks like we don't have any attendees who right. would like to participate. We'll, we'll go ahead and close comment period. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Number, item, number four, item, old business, go ahead. Yes, sir, this item is for action. This item is the acceptance of a $150,000 grant from the, for the Town Common, Phase 2, from the Dare County Tourism Board. The Tourism Board has um, is support, provided support for Phase 1 of the Town Common project, and now they're also providing proposed support for Phase 2. This $150,000 grant would, would go to the construction of restrooms in a shade structure, placement of kiosks for public information, as well as site features, chairs and things and tables and things like that to enhance the, the user experience at this location. Uh, these items were considered as part of the conceptual plan. Uh, we knew we couldn't do this project all in one fell swoop, but now that we're moving to phase one is going so well, uh, it seems appropriate to move forward with phase two and try and get all the desired improvements there. So uh, at this point though, it would take a, a motion second and a vote should the board decide to accept this grant and then to authorize the town manager to actually execute the grant agreement with the Dare County Tourism Board. All right, uh, can we have a motion to accept the $150,000 grant from the Tourist Bureau for phase two of the town commons? I move to accept the $150,000 grant from the Dare County Tourism Board uh, for the town common and authorize the town manager to execute the grant agreement. Is there a second? I second it. This is Betty. Uh, okay, there's a motion and a second that we uh, uh, approve the $150,000 grant from uh, the Tourist Bureau in regards to Town Commons. Uh, James, take a poll. Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Selby, I or nay? Aye. Commissioner Collins, I or nay? Aye. Commissioner Mann, I or nay? Aye. Commissioner Borland, I or nay? Aye. And Commissioner Burke, I or nay? Oh, wait. Commissioner Walker, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Walker, I um, did not write. I, <laughs> I was wondering if Chris Terry was on the line. <laughs> I'm okay. here. If I, if I, um, I so, and I'm sure the town clerk, she's raised her hand. I'm sure she has noted the time that you entered the meeting, Com uh, Commissioner Walker. So okay. if I may add you to the oh, vote. No, I've been, yeah, I've been here since 510. Fantastic. Well, okay. I have, but I couldn't get on, uh, Christine. I didn't uh, either. It was asking for a pass a passcode that I didn't have, but I I, I, did, I, I had the wrong pass. I did too. I had the wrong passcode, but that, that, we're we're here. That's what counts. <laughs> All yeah, right, uh, Chris, Christine's uh, recorded as yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All um, right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The motion carries. I guess James, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Motion carries. We're all on board. Yes, sir. Uh, James, how yes. much money is that we've gotten from the Tourist Bureau so far in total? So uh, that would that would make uh, between three hundred seventy one and three hundred seventy two thousand dollars for this project, sir. 
Yeah, that's not bad. They've been good to us. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, mayor comments? I don't have any. Let's go down the list. Betty. Yeah, I do have a few. Um, I do want to say thank you to, to Dare County Tourist uh, Board Bureau for um, granting us the money. With that said, I think we need some signage out there letting people know that this is a future town commons as well as the Davis, Pro Davis project too. People keep asking me what's going on there, what's going on there. If we had a sign letting people know the great works we're doing and, you know, the, what the project is, I, I think that would be fantastic. Cut down on some questions, not that we mind it. Second thing, congratulations to IT. Um, everything looks good and updated. And my other comment is, I am certainly glad that we look forward to healing with our nation. Um, our nation, of course, was rocked off its core January the 6th. It, in my opinion, embarrassed our whole country. So I'm looking forward to the healing of the new administration. And I'm certainly proud that we have the first African-American black vice president the first woman vice president the first asian american it gives all of us hope i'm just so almost emotional about it so i'm excited that our children all across this nation can see people our little girls that look like them and that inspires them for I get emotional. As far as them, that they can look up and be anything they want to be. So I'm happy. I'm excited today. We're January 6th. I was embarrassed, but I am so happy today. That's my comment. All right. Well said. Richie? I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Jason? No, I think I think I said enough already. I I know. I apologize. I, you know, I get a I get a little bit out of turn going down the, the rabbit hole. Um, oh, I did want. To no, you don't. I, the, uh, the special events. Jason, here. Jason, you're a Jason, you're a commissioner. You can say what you want to time meeting. <laughs> Eddie. Uh, did, Jason, did you have something you want to say? I was going to say the the special events committee. They uh, they met, had their first meeting. Um, so that group is gotten together and uh, that's a that's a good thing that they're going to start rolling i think the first meeting was mostly getting caught up and information intake from james and michelle and, and then they can kind of get to work uh at their next meeting so um they're, they're moving in the right direction good eddie yes sir i kind of like to second uh commissioner selby about the signage at the uh um Town Commons and the Davis Law. I have had some questions about that too, and it would make it easier if people could see, like a, uh, I don't know if you call it a vision board or a project board, whatever you want to call it, but something that shows the vision of what that's going to look like uh, upon completion. And uh, I do want to thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you said a long time ago you were going to get many of a fair shake at the Torch Bureau and, and get money for the town, and you've done that. I know you're not going to brag on yourself, but I, I appreciate everything you've done to to get uh, a manual. Let me tell you something, Eddie. Thank you so much, but this is a board project and every commissioner on that board, we're going to all be very proud and it's a time team effort. We've all done it. So I just want to say that. I haven't done anything, but I couldn't do it without y'all. Well, you did that. <laughs> Amen, Eddie. Dale? Uh, this is for James. Uh, any updates on the Shallow Bag Bay uh, sewer pump station replacement? Yeah, yes, yes, sir, Commissioner Collins. And that particular one, we have um, uh, we have been in close contact with the with the engineers on that. They've also subcontracted uh, structural, architectural things like that as well. In fact, we hope by the next workshop, we believe by the next workshop meeting that we can bring to you the draft plans because we want to not only bring it to the board, just like we gave our update at the prior meeting, but we want to, we want to let, let the public know what's going on because, you know, things like this are, are very exciting. And, and it's also one of, one of the, one of the larger projects we will have, we will have done in the last number of years. So uh, we, we believe we'll have those ready for an upcoming update to the board. Uh, depending on the agenda, I know the first meeting in February is a rather, uh, it has likely to be a very heavy agenda. 
but sh surely we can bring it to you either at that meeting or at the follow at the following one uh, with exhibits as well, not just not just verbal narrative, but also actual exhibits we can share. I'd like to thank you for all the hard work and input that you did for uh, for this project, and I, I wish I do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right, Christine. I'm sorry. Who <laughs> cut in? Yes, sir. Oh. Um, Go ahead, Christine. I thought somebody cut in. Okay. Um, James, I know I uh, have asked you before about the condition of Devon Street. Um, and I just, you know, want to say again, I know so many, well, I know there's, you know, other pressing needs in the town, but you know, whatever we can do on Devon, you know, they're they're always cutting uh, the road there in front of um, Jamie and Nadine Daniels' house. And there's there's some couple places on that road that, you know, if we could just make sure that um, kept up with some some rock in the meantime, um, or whatever they can do, it just it's kind of bumpy there. And I know we've had some awful weather and. You know, I, I do want to thank you for, you know, keeping us updated on the town common. I know the weather has, you know, been a bear for them to keep that project on schedule. So I do appreciate that. But, you know, whatever we can do to maintain um, all the roads in town, you know, that maybe aren't where they need to be right now, but um, just with a little, a little extra love this time of year, um, I'd appreciate it. Yes, ma'am, we'll, and we'll continue our coordination with DOT. I know, I know a lot of these are DOT roads. I know, but they, but we've been trying to work really closely with them, and we uh, right. acknowledge your concerns. But also, um, they have tried to be responsive within their ability, and and also we've tried to be very helpful in clearing things out, such as that uh, the pipe there on Sir Walter Raleigh that uh, our team was able to do. So we will continue to reach out right. with DOT and do what we can. And I'm, but I appreciate your 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 words there and we'll share them with our team yeah i just want to keep my neighbors happy <laughs> <laughs> you're right you're right christine it's a christine you're right it's a bad road yeah they're yeah and they're vehicles i should say so yeah i appreciate whatever yeah. we can do and um yeah yeah thanks y'all uh, james i've got one thing to offer before we adjourn uh what are we going to do? Don't we? Are you plan? I know you are. You're planning already for a uh, a full scale plan board meeting, like all day meeting, like we had last year. Are you planning for that? Oh yes, uh, and 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 to clarify, we we uh, we will have kind of a budget planning budget planning session, which is the precursor to a full scale budget thing, and of course the community engagement that follows that. And uh, it's ac it's actually I've got a uh, I've got a draft email co uh, coming out so that it is likely to. You be related to my fish right on top of that fish. Uh, yeah, well, and I'll make sure to co coordinate directly with the board in terms of, in terms of a couple of things we have in mind. So yes, sir, I'll make sure to communicate with you on the topic. And we. All right. Well, just I, I I just knew you were planning on it, and we just need to be informed about when and where. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. I, all right. Uh, there's about four conversations going on here. Uh, let's have a motion to uh, to re uh, adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. This is yeah, our motion to adjourn. All right. There's a second. I'll second. This is Christine. Oh. Okay, a motion by Daryl, second by Christine, that we adjourn until when, yes, James? Sir. The next meeting date will be on Wednesday, February 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And if you'd like, I can take a roll call uh, for the, on the motion. Yeah, go ahead. Mayor Pro Tem Selby, iron A. Aye. Mr. Collins, iron A. Aye. Commissioner Walker, iron A. Aye. Commissioner Mann, iron A. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Borland, I or nay? Aye. And Commissioner Burke, I or nay? Aye. I thought somebody else might answer for me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the motion is, unani uh, is passed unanimously. All right. We stand adjourned till February the 3rd at uh, 6 o'clock. 6.30, sir. 
Six thirty then. All right. See y'all. Take care. Good night. Uh, Good night.